the European Union Age 2020, which um, helps me to come here uh, in Australia. Uh, and we have a bunch of collaborators. As you will see in this presentation, it's really pre-disciplinary in order to understand these uh, concentration processes. And we have a, a lot of colleagues from the University of Montpellier, uh, Lyon, Geneva, and um, Toulouse as, as well, who helped us um, in the different techniques we have used. First of all, uh, what are the concentra concentration process of rare metals? And I would like to invite you to look at this diagram here on the right hand side, which defines rare metals. Rare metals are rare in the continental crust, but they can be as well strategic or critical to our economies. In this diagram, uh, the y-axis indicates the supply risk of the different metals that I will mention and the economic importance uh, of these metals. The most critical metals are rare earth elements. And we, I will talk in this presentation more specifically about germanium. In the last slides, I will show you that the process we have highlighted may be highly relevant as well for other different of rare metals. This diagram has been drawn by the European Union 10 years ago. So definition of criticality depends on the economy and the resource. So one country has its own land. And I have to confess that I haven't found anything similar for Australia. Uh, and there is a recent uh, report from the um, Geoscience of Australia, like one or two years ago, but it's more or less like a, a strongly inspired by the USGS report and the European Union report. So there has been no really definition of criticality of these rare metals for Australasia or Australia. So, what kind of concentration are we talking about? For example, germanium has an average concentration in the crust of 1.5 ppm. It can be found in traces around a few thousands of ppm uh, in zinc and coal deposits. Why do we need germanium? Just one slide. Uh, this is from the USGS report for 2017. It is mostly used in military infrared optics, but it can help as well enhance the, the, the efficiency of solar panels, and it, and it can be used as well as other polymer, polymerization agents and a catalyst. So this is one of the, these rare or critical metals that are really important for our grow, growing low-carb society, which is based on, based on green technologies. From a mineralogical point of view, where can we find Germany? It is mostly exploited nowadays uh, in concentration of about 1,000 ppm in zinc sulfide, which is sphalerite. So it is localized in the crystal lattice of sphalerite and has this kind of concentration of 1,000 ppm. It has to be extracted by heavy hydrometallurgical and pyrometallurgical means. But what we found, and it has been reported in the literature as well, that germanium can be located in tiny minerals. If you look at this scale here, this is 30 microns. So this mineral is a carburite, which is a germanium bearing chloride. It is like 100 microns in length. Here's a scale with like 200 microns. On this picture here, you can see a germanium iron oxide, which is named Bruno Gererite. Uh, the scale here is 20 microns. So this can be concentrated up to 70 weight percent germanium. So these are really um, like germanium bonds compared to what you can find very diluted in the sphalerite lattice. This is from the mineralogical point of view. 
from a geological point of view, we can find geraniums in various settings. So this is a, a, a simplified sketch of different geologic environments in which you can find uh, geranium. It can be found in uh, sedex type deposits or volcanic um, uh, massive sulfide deposits, cupuscita vein type deposits, and in orogenic type deposits. Germanium minerals can be found in the in the location here, mostly uh, orogenic deposits or vein type deposits. They have been reported in the literature. And in this presentation, I will focus on orogenic mm -hmm. deposits and more specifically, uh, lead zinc deposit, lead, lead zinc germanium deposit set are located in the Verstum Pyrenean axial zone. So this is a long way from here, and that's a part of the wall. Uh, a small sketch of uh, France. Here you can see the, the uh, shape of France, the shape of Spain. In blue are the Variscan Massif. The Variscan Massif is a, an origin that has been being built uh, during the Carbonifers. And the Pyrenees Axial Zone is located here at the border between France and Spain. In this map, which is a zoom on this Pyrenees Axial Zone, you can see that it is mostly made of grey Paleozoic metasedimentary rocks that are intruded by variscan granitoids and metamorphic domes, so crystalline rocks. And all these yellow stars are um, historic lead zinc deposits. It has been exploited or not, but occurrences of lead zinc that has been reported in the literature. And we will focus on some of these in the uh, Bosost Antiquino realm, which is located in the central part of the Pyrenean Axial Zone. Uh, a very short overview of the macrostructural framework of this um, ledging deposit. This will be very important because we will look at the process at the micro scale afterwards. But I would like to show you that um, my students' work is did, a, did a lot of field work and deciphering, unraveling the different phases of deformation in a polymetamorphic origin, which is quite uh, tedious. And he found that the, this different sketch in gray, the metasediments, is red, the intruding granites and domes. There is different generation of foliation and different generation of lead zinc mineralization as well. Uh, one in yellow, which is folded within the foliation, which is early in the formation of the origin. And the other one, I'd like to draw your attention to this blue type, type to be a vein type, which are cross-cutting parallel to the latest foliation and make these vertical <coughs> veins here on this fieldwork picture. You can see the trace of this subvertical latest deformation, which we are named S2, and this vein type of Decimetricized vein, vein type which contains uh, lead and zinc minerals, which is sphalerite, galena, which is well quartz and calcite. And in this presentation, I will focus only on this type 2 vein. Oops, and I will show you <coughs> what processes we have here when we have a deformation, foliation, overprint on these veins. So the question is, we are in an origin. All the rocks, the sediments, the leading deposits, where, whatever they were at the beginning, where there were sedex or VHMS or whatever, they have suffered origin. Um, I would always suffered once when the reviewer told me maybe they have enjoyed it. Anyway, <laughs> I like using the word suffered. They have suffered metamorphism. And what happens? So metamorphism, deformation, means recrystallization. 
And what happens to the sphalerite, which is this picture in the background, this sphalerite and germanium when there is recrystallization. To answer this question, I'll first show you a few uh, pictures giving some hints on the texture of the sphalerite. On the top part of this uh, diagram, uh, this is an optical microscope uh, view of sphalerite. So this is a, lead, a zinc sulfide, which shows some brownish domain, dark brownish, reddish, and some yellowish domains. In white here, you can see the trace of this late foliation, which is subvertical. So under the microscope, we can't see really much. We see some domains which are a bit dusty, but we can't see much. What we've done to have a better understanding on the texture and the grain size of sphalerite, we've done some analysis with EBSD, which is electron backscattered um, analysis which shows the crystallographic orientation of the grains that I will show you in the next slide, but it shows as well the grain size. It defines the grain boundaries. So in this um, very same domain, in which in the, under the optical microscope we couldn't see much, we could see here some domains which are marked here in brown, which are large grain over 100 micron in size. And you can see some domains, some blue grains that we have marked blue, which are much smaller, we have less than 100 micron in size. And in yellow are spotted the different German minerals we have found, like Bruno uh, which is a German iron oxide, or carborite. I will show you some zooms to see the, the textural relationships of these minerals with the surrounding uh, sphalerite in the next step. Now they are very, very small. This is 500 microns, so we can just spot them. So two different kind of grain sites, large sphalerite grains, which are colored here in brown, and small sphalerite grains, which are here colored in blue. So two grain sites of sphalerite. What does it mean in terms of process? Uh, just to show you that we've made some statistical analysis on the different grains in these images and the threshold between the large grains here in brown and the small grains is around one is at 100 microns. On the top figure over here, this is the very same area as I've shown you here. But this very colorful picture is an EBSD map indicating the crystallographic orientation of the different grains. You can recognize here maybe the large brown grain, this large over one micro grain that was brown, which is here blue and kind of homogeneous blue and green. And here on the left hand side is very patchy domain of tiny grains with different colors, <coughs> meaning that each grain has a very different orientation to its neighbor. On this profile here from B to A, which is depicted here on the bottom, it shows the misorientation from one grain to its neighbor. In the large grain over here, the first half of the, of the of the profile, we show this misorientation very smoothly from 0 to 20 degrees, in the indicating that sphalerite, this large band of sphalerite, deforms in a plastic manner. If we enter here this domain, which is very patchy, tiny grains with a large variation of misorientation be between the grains and their neighbors, are jumping from 20 to 60 degrees it shows that this domain is recrystallized. So the fine grain domains are daughter grains from the recrystallization from this parent grain. So dynamic, these pictures 
evidences that the main uh, process leading to the different brain sites within the same uh, thin section is dynamic recrystallization. So we have evidence this process of dynamic recrystallization. And what is now the link with the chemistry of sphalerite? This is a map. This is not the very same area, but this is a sphalerite grain as well. This is a crystalline graphic orientation picture of a sphalerite grain, very colorful. Where it's more homogeneous, it is a parent grain. Where it's more like patchy, it's a recrystallized domain. Here in white, <coughs> the trace of the S2 foliation, the latest foliation. And on the right hand side, this is uh, LIPS, which is a laser induced breakdown spectroscopy figure <coughs> or image, which is an all optical uh, technique, which is used to map qualitatively the amount of a certain, a certain element. And this is a map for germanium. The minimum, so low concentration are spotted here in blue. It's below, let's say, below 100 microns. And in dark, we are between 100 and 600 microns. Uh, sorry, not microns, but... Um, uh, yeah, ppm. Parts per million, ppm. And in yellow, we are above a few weight percent. We'll get into quantification of this chemistry in the next slides, but from a qualitative point of view, we can notice that these yellow spots, which correspond to the germanium granules, are located in the fine grain recrystallized domain. If you can see it here, see it here. If you are not convinced, I think I have a zoom on the next slide. This is a zoom which is a bit maybe more clear because it just shows the grain size, not the crystallographic orientation. In brown, this is sphalerite. In blue, parent sphalerite. In brown, in blue, recrystallized domain. And in yellow, the germanium minerals, which are mostly located in the recrystallized domains or here in some twins or some weak part of the, of the crystallized crystal system. So this is 500 micron. Let's jump to even a smaller scale to have a look at these minerals because we have to spot them at a smaller scale. This is 100 micron. This is one of these germanium minerals. It's a blue jerry right, which is maybe like um, 20 microns, and here copper right, and they seem in textural equilibrium with their surrounding daughter sphalerite plants. So I hope that with these um, techniques and a few images, I've convinced you that the main process leading to the uh, formation of small grain domains is dynamic recrystallization. And in these domains, we do have sitting here this germanium bond. Now let's look at the chemistry. The chemistry associated to this variation in texture. On the left hand side, this is a grain size map, EBSD, so colors are a bit, little bit different. In gray, these are parent grain, parent sphalerite grain. In red, daughter fine-grained sphalerite and yellow spots are germanium minerals and blue spots are copper-rich uh, minerals. We'll zoom in one of these areas over here. The dark red is the parent grain and we have performed LA ACPMS, so laser ICPMS spots <coughs> to have the concentration of a bunch of trace elements in situ is a spot of, I think we are at 36, 36 microns in width. In this parent grain, we have concentration of a few hundreds of ppm of germanium, like 500, 500, 400, 404. And when we come into these recrystallized domains, really small domains here in yellow, concentration drop below 10 ppm. So this strong textural heterogeneities 
are associated to strong chemical heterogeneities as well. So it's it's like uh, an order of magnitude lower. At this case, this is 100 micron. <coughs> if you want to sum all these geochemical data together, this is what geochemists like to do to plot uh, two different elements against each other. So this is a, a diagram showing concentration in germanium in x axis in y axis and copper in x axis. Uh, please note that these are EMPL data, so microprobe data, and the detection limit for this technique is 80 ppm. But it's for the sake of this study, it, it shows the same. I will show you after some LACPS, LAC, ACPMS data which have lower detection limit, but this is very easy to get um, data show exactly what we need. Um, it shows that in this correlation diagram, these brownish spots here and the, the white one are analyses that have been made in parent sphalerite grains. And concentration ranges from a few hundred of ppm to 600 ppm. So this is a concentration range of, of the parasolarite grain. When we have analyzed a um, recrystallized grain, down on the bottom of the diagram, it's below detection limit. Uh, please note that for this kind of analysis, the spot can be very small, it can be only 2 microns. Whereas when we do LACPML LACPM data, the resolution is much better in terms of concentration, <coughs> but the spot is much larger, it's like 30 or 40 microns. So if you want to imagine kind of a mass balance, so this shows exactly what we have here. We have the parent grains having a few hundreds of ppm germanium, and the recrystallized grains, which are depleted, almost muscle. So if you want to imagine a, a, a mass balance, we have to imagine that all the germanium that has been like sitting around in the sphalerite parent grain lattice has been like concentrated into germanium minerals and it would not fit this scale, because this scale this is, is only a few hundreds of microns. These German minerals are really tiny, but they have like 15 to 70 weight percent German, so it would be very high if you use the same scale. So in this diagram, it just like depicts this yellow spot, just depicts the mass balance we need to take into account uh, for, uh, for the system, if we consider it closed at the sample. Uh, just one slide to show you that with LACPMS data you can get simultaneously a whole range of different chemical elements uh, with detection limits we are, which are much lower. This is germanium <coughs> versus copper and gallium, which is also a rare metal which can be critical depending on, on where you sit in the world uh, uh, against copper and showing that you have different kind of substitution involving germanium copper but in some kind of textural position, you have a competing substitution as well, which in, involves uh, gallium in the, in the zinc lattice. So we'll not enter into the geochemical detail. Uh, Alexandre has a PhD submitted in mineral deposita with a lot of geochemical data, but uh, I, I will not uh, dig into this now. The important message is that uh, we have the strong heterogeneities in concentration, which are associated to uh, dynamic crystallization. Uh, the one slide that is at Jokins likes a lot as well, but it, it helps maybe understanding, taking a little bit of distance. When you look at uh, all germanium versus copper chemical composition of sphalerite in um, a lot of deposits worldwide, whatever the um, emplacement context, so Alexandre has made a, a, a huge um, summary and grabbed all this data in the different papers, 
to plot them in the very same diagram, please note that this is a log scale. And so first, what you notice first is that there is, there is a wide range of concentration in germanium and copper phosphatorite in the different lead, lead deposits worldwide. As a comparison, the Pyrenean axial zone trend is here this uh, dark purple are the parent grains and the bluish uh, uh, spot here, cloud here, are the depleted recrystallized grains. So this is the trend from the Pyrenean axial zone. So there is a, um, a large variation in chemistry of sphalerite at global scale, and this trend can be interpreted as a variation in texture, so in representation processes, but there may be a lot of these processes hidden to explain this large variability. And what is important is that often um, for exploration, uh, you chemistry, 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 maybe bulk chemistry, maybe laser acid gas. But it's important to link the textural information in order, in order to understand the processes. I will come back to this at, at the end of the talk. So what the model for germanium hyperconcentration? Oh, it's a redistribution. We are kind of in a closed system at sample scale. But it does concentrate at, at millimeter scale. So our idea, oops, our idea is that we do have these veins made of sphalerite here in like a dark green. This sphalerite may have um, chemical zonation, heterogeneities. Uh, it's primary sphalerite crystallizing in these vertical veins, and at some point. Recrystallization, which is associated to a deformational event, and freeze as well. Everything happens as if the germanium, which sits in the sphalerite lattice, the primary sphalerite lattice, is expelled and reprecipitates in those tiny germanium minerals here in yellow leaving behind a depleted, recrystallized matrix of sphalerite. One word about the condition we think uh, need to preside to this, to this uh, recrystallization. The, condition, it's, uh, the conditions are pretty difficult to determine Directly, but indirectly, if we look at the late, uh, latest uh, variston deformation phase, it is Grinsey's phases. So something like 250 to 400 degrees at a low pressure. What's important to note is we probably need oxidizing fluid. Um, it was quite difficult to find a thermodynamic phase diagram showing the different stability of the phase of the, the stability of the different germanium bearing, bearing phases, whether they are sulfur or uh, oxide or silicate, sulfide oxide or silicate, uh, depending on the activity of oxygen and the activity of, of sulfur. But what we see is that most of the minerals which crystallize in the Pyrenean axial zone are silicate or oxide. So we m might have kind of a higher oxygen fugacity, and we don't find all of these germanium sulfides that can be found in some other deposits like uh, Mount Carlton or in the Kipuchitak. So having this evidence, this characterizing these minerals helps also deriving the conditions of the thermodynamic conditions, pressure, temperature, uh, fluid condition for this, um, this process to occur, this remobilization to occur. Okay, so, um, is it everything okay? Hello? 
Now I'll try to show you a few examples in different chemical systems um, that you might have also the same processes. First of all, to um, show you some examples that metals can be mobile during metamorphism. metamorphism. This is an example of prograde metamorphism in the autophagies in New Zealand. And with an unmetamorphosed rock, which bears like gold, uh, silver, arsenic, mercury, molybdenum, and tin, when temperature increases, uh, pyrite recrystallizes into pyrotite. And uh, these metals are recrystallized into specific minerals like cobaltite, sphalerite, and galena. But at higher temperature, the stability of pyrotite and and, and changes of the different mineral changes, and that amphibolite phases condition, these phases are not thermodynamically stable anymore, and these metals may be uh, leached from the system and, and be um, taken by uh, pervasive metamorphic threats. Other example, or which is another rare metal which has an affinity for this system is andium. Uh, Lockington et al. made a study in different metamorphose or orogenic lead zinc deposits, which are in Norway and in Australia, and they have shown a large variability in andium from 0 to 140 ppm in these different uh, deposits. And the author also explains this um, depletion in indium in some very specific localities by the formation of specific mineral, uh, which is here, for example, rocosite, which is a copper indium uh, sulfide. Uh, finally, this is not a rare metal, but it can be also very mobile during metamorphism, gold. It has been shown that some metamorphose VHMS deposits show a large variability of composition of, of gold, uh, depending on the texture of the different minerals, like in porphyroblasts it's very uh, depleted in gold, whereas in the fine grain massive ore, it, can, it shows a large variability in concentration. Uh, some recent study has, has looked at the deformation of pyrite and they have shown, since all these spots are enriched in gold, that gold, this is a misorient or crystallographic orientation map of a pyrite grain, which is mostly undeformed ex except for grain boundary or late fracture, and gold is mostly enriched uh, in the recrystallized matrix or along uh, grain boundaries. So there is a mobility as well of gold grain metamorphism. So this idea is not new, but I believe that uh, this process may be uh, widespread for uh, rare metals. Uh, speaking recently with a magmatic pathologist who is looking at rare earths, the so most important deposits of rare earths worldwide are found in carbonatites or in alkaline granites. And this colleague is studying uh, carbonatites from, uh, from Morocco. And I say, you know, like, yes, it's in the magma, it's magmatic, magmatic rare earths, blah, blah, blah. And she said, you know what? I find that rare earths mineral <coughs> when the carbonatite <coughs> there is a slight hydrothermal, hydrothermal overprint associated with deformation or not, but I believe that we need some working of the magmatic problem for rares as well. Uh, so the idea is 
that usually mineral exploration is based on screening of bulk rock geochemical analysis and anomalies on maps and uh, geophysical anomalies. But this kind of resource, so tiny minerals, would be totally overseen by these uh, traditional techniques. So looking at maybe a different characteristic or different uh, features of the rocks would be very interesting for exploring for this kind of removalized, uh, highly enriched uh, tiny minerals. And one very simple criteria would be just texture, the texture of the rock. So it's is a very easy first guess. On the left hand side, this is a recrystallized sphalerite. So very tiny grains, and there are German and mineral, minerals which are present. On the right hand side, a uh, coarse uh, parent sphalerite, which does not contain sphalerite. So even from the back of the room, or even a non geologist, you just notice this grain size difference. And after that, you, of course, you can do high tech, like measuring grain boundaries and the of water. But the first thing is just maybe just looking at texture before doing some spray of screening. And I know that people usually look at this textural information. So um, I guess this need to be um, uh, shouldn't be overseen as well. Uh, I just first have to see that from an academic point of view, this process is very important. But the economic importance of these very tiny minerals has not been assessed yet. So I'm just talking all that, uh, considering that um, it can be a resource. But we need, still need to uh, work out, also maybe from a technical point of view, and with the mining companies, whether these tiny minerals are economically viable. Can just extract them. I just imagine that just because they are uh, just physically different, different density, different, maybe much more easier to extract from a rock than, than using heavy chemicals to leach germanium from a, uh, from a grain lattice. So this still needs to be sought and considered, but um, we should at least give a thought in this. I, in the, um, time now where we are looking for being a bit more independent on critical metals as a resource and not only of buying them from China or different countries. So this idea needs to be explored, I guess. Uh, I first presented this talk in Peking. This is a, a conference for mineral system of the Pacific Rim in April. And they say, yes, that's great. Uh, you talk about the Europe, but uh, is it relevant for us here? So I added this slide, um, which shows the map of Australia with the different lead zinc deposits according to their the type, type, either Mississippi Valley type or VHMLS or blah blah blah. And all the, most of these lead zinc deposits in Australia are located in ancient origin. Central Australia, Mount Isa, um, here, Pilbara, Broken Hill, this ancient origin. So they may have been Mississippi Valley type in the beginning, but they have suffered already. So some remobilization must have occurred. So I guess there is a huge potential to look at this germanium and associated minerals, these like cousins, germanium, gallium, angium are really have a good affinity with zinc, lead and zinc deposits. So this, there is huge potential, I guess, for looking at this resource here in Australia. And after that talk at Pecrim I had in, in April, there was a, a person, a researcher from the audience, uh, Travis Murphy, and he was, oh yes, you know, in my PhD in 2004, uh, in Mount Isa, George Fisherman in Mount Isa, I actually had a look at different texture of the of the uh, sphalerite, and he, he showed me two pictures from his PhD. On the top side, it looks like a really equilibrated texture of sphalerite. On the bottom slide, you have large variability in grain size. These larger grains 
looking like clusters, and these smaller grains maybe are crystallized. So this information in here, you just need to take it into account and to understand the processes and maybe find or spot this novel resource which may be interesting for the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, this is uh, my PhD students, Alexandre, who is finishing uh, now this week. With the uh, time difference, we are very, very efficient in correcting his PhD. He sends me some manuscript in the evening when he sleeps, I'm correcting. Next morning, it's a correction. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very efficient and um, it's really hardworking and he's looking forward to it. Thank you for your time. Um, yes, the <laughs> question or statement I'm trying to work it through. Um, that was fascinating, that last argument about George Fisher. I did a PhD many, 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 many years earlier than that on a deposit. One of the deposits on your diagram near Mount Isa, the same sort of deposit, exactly the same sort of textures, um, and it's been mine. Now, I'm, I'm just wondering, and, and I don't recall the germanium contents, the bulk germanium contents that I worked out at the time. But metallurgically, how do you take advantage of this this discrimination between fine grain and, and coarse grain? To, I mean, yeah, I know you're not a metallurgist, but I'm just trying to figure out out loud how you would take advantage to actually get the germanium, get the cook, the finer grain material, and concentrate that. And and, and, and I think the finer grain, fine grain material, which is only like 10 ppm, it's not worse. And they are actually not exploited uh, currently, uh, the finer grain. Most of the lead zinc deposits that are exploited for germanium are, uh, like I showed in first, can we go quickly back or? Oops. The very first slide, oops. That one. Most of the germanium which is now exported nowadays are in sphalerite, which are propolisome, like a homogeneous concentration around 1,000 or 3,000 ppm, and, and it is extracted from this kind of sphalerite. It is not extracted from this corrogenic deposit. So, Germany. Yeah. I was just wondering what difference it makes in a metallurgical sense. Those deposits, in a, they're massive deposits in, in northern Australia, they're all green sheets. And they're not particularly coarse grain in, in essence. But um, you see the textural variation. I think when yeah. you process this as a mining, or you process like a uh, like big size piece of yeah. crops, and this variation at very small size, so it's a few tenths of microns. So yeah. you just miss all this information. You just take something like a. We, we did kind of a calculation uh, on a thin section. It's a very rough calculation, first order calculation. Um, we've considered um, like having a depleted sphalerite and only maybe 0 0.0.1 surface percent or volume percent of these German minerals. And we have distributed it back into the sphalerite in the same surface or the same volume. And we ended up having a few hundreds of ppm in 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 the sphalerite lattice. So in the end I think this process, this redistribution at a such a small scale, so we just don't see it. The thing is maybe being more efficient if these tiny tiny minerals are really at different densities, different physical properties, you may just get these more quickly. But this I don't know. I've tried to ask some persons, but it's not yet so much for you. Never get it out. What? You never get it out. You think you never get them out? The only way you'll get that is by taking the sphalerite out and you process the sphalerite in the zinc. Mm -hmm. uh, in the smelting process, there's no <coughs> way a metallurgist will ever get that out of the primary deposit. You can mine things, can you really? You can't river stuff that are floating it down to seven microns, which was a challenge. Mm -hmm. Work very well below fixed that up, so we can do 10 micron stuff, but the concentration of germanium 
things like that, you never ever justify commercial extraction of it. You'd have to take the, the zinc out separately, the process it separately. Yeah. And the yeah. germanium price, while it is essential in modern electronics, it's simply not high enough to justify a commercial operation. Do you know other chemical systems? That's a question I've been asking around. Do you know other chemical systems in which, like, small minerals, maybe tens of microns, hundreds of microns, which are highly concentrated, minerally, mi mm, physically different, are exported <coughs> in other chemical systems? I don't speak of Germany. In uh, down, it, it is very, very difficult to get down under about 50 microns, floating stuff out. Even then, that's a risk. And one of the metal works, by the way, so they don't shoot me down in flames. Um, I've just seen a lot of mines over my career, and they just can't do it. The carbon river was a real funny one because they struggled for years to make that much work. And to get down at that level, you'd have to have a fairly rich ore body. And we don't even talk about yeah, the primary, <laughs> primary minerals in it. The others would be the bonus. I'm not sure my memory is certainly correct, but I think back in the <coughs> 1960s uh, when Ron Pollock was the major exporter of all the rare earths, and they were never required in the point as they are now. He extracted a whole lot of uh, germanium concentrates in Australia and South of Perth. And they just left, and they closed everything with all the mining down, and they just sold them. following the, the same line of questioning, uh, they, they contain iron, these um, germanium minerals. I don't know anything about them. Some of them, yes. Like rhodogerite, ru yes. I wondered if they're magnetic and if, like ilmenite in perhaps a fine grained Win 150 situation, you could run them over a, magnet a yeah. magnetic system for separation. They're very different. Like there is rhodogerite as iron, carburite is a silicate. You have argute, argutite, which is like a German oxide. There's a bunch of these, you know, like the thing is that they're not all the same. Maybe, yeah, more concentration or... <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Can you tell us um, what countries and what kind of um, deposits commercial operations actually are producing in Germany currently? Um, I think most of the germanium is, is mined from coal because coal deposit it has a strong affinity with coal and and it is mined I think in China. Yeah. So the germanium Saint Salvi has been mined uh, until the eighties in France, which is a mine in France, but uh, now it's it's not operating. Is that black coal? Black coal. Black coal. Brown coal. Yeah. Carbon is like carbon and pulp, the carbon would suck it up. So, so would the carbon is actually locked in chemically with the organics. Yes, it has, a strong, organic, it has a strong affinity with organic matter as well. Right. Yeah. Any Students, was everything clear? <laughs> you guys. Even for the, the thermomechanical models, it's okay. <laughs> So you guys yeah. will need to figure out the new metallurgical processes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. it's it's <laughs> Got a few hundred million dollars. You want yeah, yeah. yeah, some of them do it. Okay, great. Well, um, it's a great honor to have you here, Benedict. Thank, thank you, you so much. And, yes. um, thank you.